What is up guys, my name is Alex and welcome to my very first Cinema 4D R13 tutorial for beginners. Now this is an introductory video on getting familiar with the Cinema 4D interface and this is towards people who have never used Cinema 4D before. Now because of that we won't be able to do any modeling or animation in this video. Uh, we'll get to that in a couple of videos later after I get finished with teaching all the basics of this program. So when you first open up the program, you have a gray interface by default. Now, towards the top of the screen and towards the left-hand side of the interface, you have these little icons, and you're probably wondering what these icons do. But I'll explain about these icons a little later. But for now, I want to get started on explaining the functions of all these modules on the interface. So let's start with the viewport. Now, the viewport is also known as the video preview and you can view what you're modeling or animating and with these little four icons on the top they allow you to navigate throughout your entire animation or scene. Now I'm just going to use my intro project file as an example. So on the first icon if you click and hold it and move it around you can basically move uh, throughout your entire scene. The second icon allows you to zoom in or out and of course the third one is going to allow you to uh, rotate around an object. Now the last icon is what brings me to my next topic. If you click it, it'll allow you to access several different perspectives of your viewport. Now as you can see here, we have a 2D representation of our scene. Now you're probably wondering why you would need a 2D perspective in a 3D program. Well. Later on, it really helps if you want to be very precise with your 3D modeling and animation. Next up, we have the Object Manager, which is right next to the viewport. It's on the top right-hand corner. And the Object Manager, in other words, is also known as the Project File Manager of Cinema 4D, meaning that it'll contain all of the objects and files that you're going to use in Cinema 4D. Now you can see here I have my text, objects, I have my lights all of those good stuff and here you can basically modify, delete or even arrange and organize all your objects in your scene. At the bottom of the object manager we have the attribute manager and if you don't have anything selected it should be blank and it's next to the uh, viewport as well. So the attributes manager is like the name says it allow you to change the attributes of a specific object so let's say we insert a cube and to do that you want to go to this little cube icon and just click it. If I select the cube in the object manager or if I select it directly in the viewport, the list of attributes for that specific object comes up. Now there's different attributes for different objects but for a cube you can change the size, modify the shape of it, add more segments and even change the coordinates of the object. And that's all really there is to it. Next to the attributes manager we have the coordinate manager and the coordinate manager is basically the same thing as the attributes manager because you can also control the position, size, and rotation of the object but the only difference between these two is that the coordinate manager allows you to change the position, size, or rotation for multiple different objects as opposed to the attributes manager which allows you to control the position size and rotation for only one specific object. So to do that I'm just going to insert another cube and place it kind of next to the other cube and I'm just going to click and drag a rectangle box in my object manager to select both of them and now I can change the position coordinates of these two objects. Now in order for the change to occur you need to change it first in here, the values, and then click apply. The last module we're going to be covering is the material manager. And the material manager is where you're going to be creating all the materials for your objects. Now you can create any type of material. You can create a chrome material, a metal material, a glass material. The list goes on. There's many different possibilities. Uh, you can create with the material manager. So when you click on the material manager, you want to go ahead and create a new material. 
or you can click on this empty gray area and double click on it and a new material will pop up. Now to change the attributes of that manager you can click it and the information for it will pop up uh, in the attributes or you can double click on the material itself and a material editor window will pop up. Now I'm not going to go into details about what all of these little options do but I'm just going to go ahead and change the color to a nice blue and to apply material to a object you can simply take the material and drag it directly onto the object in the viewport or what you can do is get the material and drop it onto the object in the object manager now once you add a material to an object a tag will appear next to the object and that will indicate that a material has been added onto that specific object and last but not least before we move on to uh, the palettes I just want to explain the timeline now the timeline is represented by frames now it's really important to understand frame rates or FPS so FPS means frames per second and normally videos are usually 24 to 29 frames per second uh, others can go as high as 60 frames per second or more but because 3D programs take sometimes a lot take a long time to render. Uh, it's usually the best way to have a fast render time is to use as little frames per second as possible. Now, the lowest recommended frame rate should be 24 frames per second. So, say if you want to create a 10 second animation, you would want to know how many frames that you need to input into this little area to make sure you have 10 seconds on your timeline. Now, to do that, it's simple math. You take whatever frame rate you're using. So if you go into your render settings right here, go to output, you have your frame rates, and I have it set it at 24. I always use I always use 24 frames per second as my default frame rate. Uh, so if I wanted 10 seconds of animation footage and my frame rate is 24, I would get my calculator and multiply 10 seconds by 24 frames each and that will give me 240 frames total and I can add frames in this little area right here so at 190 I'm going to change it to 240 press enter and drag this out and now I have 10 seconds of animation footage now I'm going to be explaining these buttons right here uh, the first and last one are basically going to the end or the beginning of the animation these two arrows right here uh, can switch between keyframes. Now I haven't selected anything with keyframes yet. So if I select my camera, keyframes in Cinema 4D are represented by these little blue rectangle boxes on the timeline. I'll zoom in. They're a little hard to see, but those are keyframes and you can actually select them. And these two little arrows, you can switch between each keyframe you have set and these little arrows on the inside you can browse through your frames and of course you have the play and pause button next up we have these three little red or slash pink icons and these are the keyframing icons so I'll explain a little bit more about them so let's say I want this cube to be animated so that it goes upwards so I'll just go to the beginning of the animation and to do that, I can first of the two options, I can manually set a keyframe or I can auto keyframe it. Now to manually set a keyframe, all I need to do is go to the part where I want the uh, animation to begin and I would select the cube and I would press this first keyframe. That will set a keyframe on whatever my cursor is at, represented by this little rectangle box. And I would go a little bit further probably a few 30 frames and after that I would get the cube and move it to where I want it to be and then I would set a keyframe again for that and if you play it back that's how you set a keyframe another way is to auto keyframe it I really don't really like to use the auto keyframe because if I tend to make a mistake I have to go back a lot of steps and uh, retrace all of my 
changes and modifications to my animation, but this is really useful if you don't want to manually set it. So to auto keyframe it, you enable it by clicking this little uh, middle button right here that looks like the rotation button. Click it, and once you enable it, if you modify any little information about your animation or your objects, move it, or resize it, rotate it, it'll automatically set those as a keyframe. So if I say for example, uh, let's see, I have this cube up here and I move it, it'll automatically set a keyframe for whatever frame I'm on without me having to manually set a keyframe. So that's how you keyframe animation in Cinema 4D. So we are on to the last part of the introduction video and in this part I'm going to be explaining a little bit more about the palettes and their purpose. But I'm going to be skipping a few of these palettes because uh, we, they really don't affect your workflow or if you're animating or modeling and they really have no purpose. So let's start off with the undo and redo tool which are pretty obvious. You know the shortcuts, Control Z and Control Y for the redo tool. The first one right here is called the live selection tool and of course it allows you to select objects in the viewport and if you click on and hold on to this little icon you have several different options. You have the rectangle selection which allows you to select multiple objects within the area of the rectangle you draw. The lasso which allows you to do the same thing as well and of course the polygon selection. Now so anytime you see an icon with this little arrow uh, facing in the bottom left right corner uh, you can click and hold it for more options. Next you have the move tool which allows you to of course move around your object. The scale tool which allows you to scale the objects either on the Y x-axis or even the z-axis. You have the rotation tool and we're going to jump on ahead to the three render option buttons. So the first one is the render active viewer and what it does is if you click it, it'll quickly render out uh, whatever frame you're on so that you can view your animation or 3D model. Now this is, think of it as a pre-rendering button, except it can only render out a still image. So if you want to view some kind of animation, uh, you can't view it in its final rendered form. You have to view it um, as a basic 3D model. Next up, we have the render active project. And this is basically the um, exporting button. So this is the final step. So if you click it, this is the final render you're going to have depending on uh, where you saved it in your render settings. And last but not least we have the edit render settings. So if you click it another window should pop up and here of course you have your project file settings and you can change the resolution and the frame rate and I'll get more onto this in my next tutorial. Next we have the add a cube object and I like to call this the primitive object option because it contains a lot of shapes that are primitive and I call them primitive because um, they're basically the building blocks or the starting point of complex 3D models so let's say I can transform just this little capsule into uh, a 3D character so these are primitive objects and spline in the next palette I like to consider splines as a blueprint or a building block of complex 3D shapes. Now here's a spline. As you can see it is a not a shape, it's represented by lines and if you render it you can't view it because it's not a shape yet. It's more of a blueprint. And in order to make it into a shape you can go into your next palette which is the add hyper nerves object, get the extrude nerves and you can get the spline and click it and drag it on top of the extrude nerve so that it's a child and here you have a 3D shape. 
And the next few ones you really don't need to worry about. You have the add array objects, the object deformer plugins. You have several floors you can make. You have your cameras, and of course you have your lights for your animations. So that brings us to the end of this introduction video for Cinema 4D R13. Um, I try to be very general about this tutorial. I don't want to go into specific details because uh, I wanted to be more specific about each individual topic in my later videos. So if you're confused on any part or have any questions about this tutorial, uh, feel free to ask me down in the comments below. I'd be more than happy to reply to all the comments or questions that you have for me. So if you want more Cinema 4D tutorials, uh, please subscribe and like or give the video a comment and I should have a video on rendering in Cinema 4D within a couple of days. So I'll see you guys next time.